You are listening to Radiant Creators, a collaborative project composed of people whose passion, purpose, and dedication requires forging their own unique path of empowerment and livelihood. A Radiant Creator isn't making a living, they are living. Robert Young Pelton, thanks for being on Radiant Creators today, radiantcreators.com. The show is also on alternatecurrentradio.com, and we're excited to have the adventurist on today. So really the core of Radiant Creators, what we try to do is we interview inspiring people to inspire others. That's just what, we're, what we kind of offer the world, a little bit of inspiration. So that's what we're here for, because Robert Young Pelton is definitely an inspiring individual. And so... How to do an intro for you is really difficult because your bio is quite large and you've done quite a lot. I'm not sure how you introduce a Robert Young Pelton, but your life started to take a change at about 40 years old, I believe, and that's when you became the adventurist. I think that's when you maybe coined the term. Can you explain that? What happened in your 40s? Uh, well, I was uh, running an ad agency and, and uh, I had a publishing company called uh, Fieldings. And um, I did uh, marketing and strategic planning for a number of companies. And um, I had a series of of events which were mentors, people that I respected in their 50s, uh, suddenly dying. And and my father died of Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, My grandfather died of Lou Gehrig's disease. And one of my clients found out he had uh, terminal bone cancer when he was playing tennis and broke a clavicle. And I had always taken a month off to do something that I wanted to do, which was typically going to those white spots on the maps. And I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, one of the things that people used to rib me about, particularly journalists that were on these expeditions, was that it wasn't actually that dangerous to go, you know, through Africa or remote places like Borneo. It was actually more dangerous to go to war zones where people were trying to kill you. And I thought, okay, I guess that's one take. And um, they sort of challenged me to say, well, see if you could find this terrorist group or this rebel group and uh, set up an interview. So that's what I did. And, and uh, I began to do these things. And um, one of the books I wrote for Fieldings was uh, The World's Most Dangerous Places. And I couldn't find anybody else to write it. So I ended up writing it. And so everything kind of came together rather quickly because I... Uh, I realized that I was really enjoying that one month out of the 12 and I had to rethink of myself as a brand. In other words, I was a product that had to be marketed because I wanted to make money doing this to support what I wanted to do. So uh, I sold the company. I did a a great deal with Microsoft so they could create Expedia. I kept dangerous places. I started making phone calls and I had no idea the impact of the people who read that book. So within literally two or three months, uh, ABC News did a huge profile on me in which I sort of invented the Sojo or solo journalist concept. I went around the world to um, the most dangerous place on each continent, and they had a film crew following me who would never actually go into those places, but that's fine. Uh, But it spawned this huge web event called ABC News Dangerous Places. I then got a TV deal with Discovery, uh, which was kind of cool because I could do whatever I want. And um, I also then became sort of a, you know, minor league celebrity because every time somebody would want to know about a a, a kidnapping or attack or whatever, they'd they'd put me on TV. So uh, the premise at that time was, oh, look, this guy is going on vacation to war zones. But that's not at all what I was doing. I was being among the first people to go in and actually live with these rebel groups. And whether it was the Taliban or the Chechen rebels in Grozny, I went through a series of you know, pretty dramatic battles and, and events, which uh, I think cemented my reputation as not as an adventurer or an explorer. So I use risk, which is someone that usually do so, does something that gets them into trouble. So that became the title of my uh, my autobiography. The adventurous, and and along with your kind of intro your story in 2010 you created the somali report and that was then later syndicated for uh u.s forces in afghanistan i believe called it was called afpax how how did that come about well okay so you remember i was a marketing guy 
I work with Steve Jobs launching the Lisa and the Mac. I work with a number of major companies, Mattel, uh, you name it. Anyway, so um, I worked as an author writing my book, and then I began to transition into working as a journalist. And so I had my first job working as a journalist, um, I worked for CNN in Afghanistan when I did that interview with John Walker Lind. Um, I worked for National Geographic. I ended up working for... 60 Minutes, CBS 60 Minutes, and ABC Investigative in the early days of the war in Iraq. And I was I was not happy with how journalism worked because you were essentially flying overpaid white guys to go <laughs> into war zones who would then hire poor little fixers to tell them what to do. And uh, it always got lost in the translation, and, and particularly in Iraq where we had sort of this one-sided message of weapons of mass destruction. Then I was actually hired by ABC and by uh, 60 Minutes to help look for weapons of mass destruction, which which didn't exist, and anybody who knew anything about Iraq knew they hadn't existed for quite a while. And um, <clears throat> I quit, and I bought a red Bentley, and I started driving around the country at the height of the war. And this Bentley would have a fuel blockage, and it would stop, and people would drag the car into the locals, uh, locals' house. And I would spend the night there talking to the Iraqis about uh, what had been going on under Saddam for the last decade. And uh, people would come and, and tell me these horrific stories and then take me to these mass graves. So I, I spent this time documenting these mass graves. And, and then I, it just dawned on me that the rest of the world is not getting any information from Iraq. You know, it's sort of blocked by the avalanche of embeds and, you know, sort of manufactured information. So I began to set up with the former head of international news, Eastern Jordan, a news network inside Iraq at the height of the war. And that means I hired Iraqis to tell me what was going on in their towns. If something had happened, um, you know, describe what happened. And then I'd have a couple other people double check on what happened. I had sort of PhD level editors, again, fact check, translate, publish. And this became probably one of the most read outputs. It was called Iraq Slogger during the Iraq war. And it was well known by all the intel people and all the journalists, et cetera, et cetera. I then took that model to Afghanistan, in which I had 1,200 people. So in Iraq, I had something like 600. In Afghanistan, in the tribal areas, it's something like 1,200 people. Um, but we basically got hijacked by the military, who were just one of our clients. I mean, we, we worked for everybody, but they realized that we were the fastest route to solve a problem. So when they dropped a bomb and killed a bunch of people, they were essentially hiring U-2s to fly over and take pictures and and we would have people on the ground actually talking to the people. So you would have this dichotomy where their very expensive intel was saying, oh, there's only 12 graves in this village, therefore the villagers are lying about this you know, attack. And we would say, well, when you went to a wedding, why would you bury your kids in somebody's front lawn? You would obviously take them home and whatever. And then we got the names of all these people. So we were a very valuable resource in that we provided common sense and access to not just the military, but other people. Um, they used to just call us all the time and say, well, what about this, what about that? So when Bo Bergdahl went missing, again, they called us and they said, hey, can you help us? And within, a, I guess, an hour or so, uh, we located Bo Bergdahl. And then we were told to wave off, even though we knew he was in Pakistan. Um, and so just things like that where ground truth and sort of common sense, uh, nonpartisan reporting can provide insight and, and assistance to keep people safe, to reduce conflict. And one of the things we did was we brought in Taliban commanders and one-star generals, and there was an Italian restaurant in Kabul where they would sit down and have dinner just to talk about things. And I remember the general would say, what the hell do I talk to this guy about? Said, well, talk to him about his kids. Talk to him about, you know, why he's fighting, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that effort. And we did that for about a year and a half until the CIA found out we were, <laughs> we were in country. And, you know, it's a hallmark to the intelligence agency that we had 1,200 people and didn't know we existed. And we were flying generals around doing peace deals, et cetera, et cetera. But I ended up on the front page of the New York Times. So I was kind of miffed about working with the uh, I went to Somalia and began tracking all the hostages in Somalia and all the ships. And so 2008, I was over there. 2010, Prince contacted me and told me he was uh, setting up this army to fight pirates. 
And I said, well, I don't want to be in business with you, but you can be a subscriber to our service. So he was a, a major part of getting you know, funding so that we could track all the hostages. And then that thing blew up and we still continued. But the point was is that once you have this access to information on the ground, it's a very powerful tool. And uh, if I was to interject something like today, we have these situations with the tankers in the Straits of Hormuz. We have plenty of people sending information about what they think is happening, what they thought happened, uh, and very little information from the actual people that are there. And that means the sailors, the ship owners, the unbiased sort of documentation of what happened. And this is the second false flag operation First one was in Fujairah. And if you analyze these things from the ground, not from the top down, from the ground up, you find some very disturbing elements. And this is this is why I was fascinated with creating ground elements. So I transitioned from being sort of a journalist to actually creating journalism in these countries. So to wrap that up, we also set up ground networks in Libya, uh, in Myanmar, and Bangladesh. And all with the goal of providing sort of unbiased, clear information, open source, by the way, this is all published and handed over to people uh, so that people can make intelligent decisions. And so when people started these disinformation campaigns, you'd have something to check it against. Especially with the issue in the the, the tankers right now. Um, and you've got Pompeo doing briefs saying that, well, alluding to or maybe directly or indirectly saying that Iran is responsible. But when I'm looking at all the media out there, looking at stories, you know, following up what's going on, if I look at comments to news stories, I often find that comments are where I tend to almost always go straight to the comments. Like I read the title, mm -hmm. and then I'll look at the comments, and then I'll go back and read the article. Because, I mean, the gold seems to be in the comments, really. And I've always been amazed at what you were doing with the Asmali Report, because... It's almost like a unique form of truthful social media where you're getting your intelligence. And I think it's making a difference because if I look at, I actually printed some of the uh, comments from uh, <laughs> articles out there. And all you're seeing is uh, replies like, wag the dog, we're not falling for it, American auto attack, false flag, pump. Pompeo holds propaganda session. I mean, pretty much people who are trying to make the accusation, people who are, well, let's say allegedly falsely reporting, um, they're just getting flamed by the comment section. I mean, I've never seen an event where this is, I guess, an alleged false flag. I've never seen an event yet that got such a backlash. I've never seen anything happen that was so, that, that nobody bought. This is, this is like, seems like a bit well, of a turning point. Yeah, and this, I'll tell you something, there's something very important going on now in communication. So we used to rely on, you know, the big three channels, which were uh, a requirement if you wanted an SEC uh, broadcast license, you had to provide news coverage, right? And so you had the, the big three providing fairly unbiased, maybe sometimes leftist, maybe sometimes rightist. But the point is that they were providing coverage of events as they saw them. And CNN broke that barrier and suddenly you had news coming from all types of outlets with the internet, you can watch Fars News in Iran, you can watch Fox News in New York, I mean, you can watch any news you want, but politicians and special interest groups gain that system, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Twitter, by either creating false information, false excitement, false viewers, uh, you know, slightly biased information that's inserted in accurate information. So people are getting smarter. And of course, the, the, the last election and the whole issue with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook actually goes back to the Iraq war, where people were very angry that suddenly America was going to be plunged into a war in, in a country we didn't really care about and um, felt that we didn't have any control over the politics. And then suddenly it turns into a disaster. And now we're looking at two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, where we feel we should be more cautious before we get dragged into conflicts because they tend to grow and, and, and shape, shape shift. Um, so now you're seeing people re selectively reading people on Twitter who are trusting some people, not trusting other people, gleaning information from offshore sources, but disregarding others. And one of the things uh, that I've been able to do is, is essentially say to people, look, you know, my agenda is clear. 
you are being manipulated by some people and some people are telling you the truth. But with all media, there's a slight distortion from the real event to what you actually see or hear. Learn how to be a news gatherer yourself. Use the tools at your finger. Glom on to people that you trust. Delete people you don't trust. And for God's sakes, don't believe <laughs> you're hearing because they're not very good at it. And this is what we're sensing from Pompeo, Bolton, Trump. They're saying things that are inherently untrue. You know, Venezuela was an example of a major disaster in which you had an unpopular socialist regime. But they tried to fabricate an event that wasn't supported on the ground. And depending how you look at it, either we should go into every country and overthrow dictators and install new governments, or we should just stay out, or we should do whatever is appropriate. But this was a sort of a patently false event pitched by a guy who's famous for being bought and sold by special interests, and it fell flat on its face. We saw the same thing in Libya with General Haftar made a move against the UN-sponsored government and failed miserably. And again, we start thinking, wow, they're trying to manipulate us. This guy can't win. He's not going to win. And all these pictures of him meeting world leaders and all this tough talk coming from his website is fictitious. So same thing in Iran. It's I don't think there's anybody in America that wants to go to war against Iran. I don't think many people in America have been to Iran. I don't think they even realize there's 80 million people there and some of the worst mountainous terrain you can imagine. And I know from my time working with the four stars that this was in the cards back in 2006, 2007. The plan was to go into Iran, uh, get it over with. In other words, we had them sandwiched, you know, with Afghanistan and Iraq. Let's just get it done, right? Let's just get the Middle East resorted out. And it doesn't work that way. You know, it metastasizes. It turns into a, a cancer and then you get terrorism. So we saw this with Afghanistan in the 80s where we supported sort of a sneaky way to get rid of the Russians, those same people became the Islamist terrorists and fighters that are chasing us around the world now. So people know that. They're smart enough to get that. So I keep saying to people, if we want a regime change, there's nothing stopping us from just going in and overthrowing a dictator and killing everybody in the country and plowing it over and selling it as real estate plots. You know, there's nothing stopping America from doing that. But it's this weird sort of let's fool the American people Tell them this and then do that, that people are wise to. Yeah, and it seems like for Iran, that would be a bit more of a challenge. I don't think that would be quite so easy. I mean, it seems like they at least have a bit of a formidable military. And could that drag other world war powers in? It seems like Russia and China just standing by and allowing that to happen seems, I don't know, not likely to me. I mean, you probably know the geopolitics well, of it much better. It's here's risky. the reality of America. We we define America's power by World War II and, and specifically D-Day. We, we see America as a massive generator of people, of tanks, airplanes, bombs, you know, and the best of the brightest. Everybody comes here to do the right thing. And so we tend to look at ourselves as someone who can right wrongs. We did that in Europe. We fought a war. We won. The Germans surrendered. Everything went back to normal. We helped rebuild the country. And that became our model for how we're going to go into other countries, right? And of course, Nazi Germany became our symbol for evil. You know, somebody that uh, persecuted minorities and Jews, somebody who, who enthralled the masses to do terrible things. So we overlay that on countries like Iran. And Iran is much more sophisticated than that. If you look at an ethnography makeup of Iran, it's, it's made out of fractured little tribal and linguistic groups. And what we now know when you go into Iraq, Iraq is not a country per se. It's a collection of people who agree to work together or don't agree to work together. Just like Afghanistan is, is a fractured collection of people who choose to work together or not work together, depending on conditions. So like Libya, we go in there. We overthrow this singular dictator because he's got a black hat and he's a bad guy. He's like the Adolf Hitler of Libya. And then suddenly we see all these complex alliances break apart. And we're like, oh, should we divide it into three pieces? Should we divide it into you know, eight pieces? Should we bring in somebody from outside to rule it? I mean, you know, should we ignore it? And suddenly we don't have answers for these questions. So this is the reality with war with Iran. Uh, the war with Iran is supposed to be an air war and a naval war. 
there's no real plans for ground troops per se. They would be proxy soldiers. The real purpose of starting a war with Iran is to protect Israel. Israel is the one that is most at threat from Iran. But we have a long standing beef because of the hostages, you know, the embassy hostages and a long history of Iran supporting people who were against the U.S. And it's not so much that we hate Iran per se, because we don't, we don't even know Iran. I mean, how many people watch Iranian news or TV? Nobody. But we have these these little dictatorships in the Emirates and Saudi Arabia that are basically one fly swat away from being overthrown by Iran. So the interest is to generate as much support in America and much hatred, as much hatred against Iran, so that if we do tip the tables, it is to protect these countries. Now, look at a map of Saudi Arabia and click on the breakdown Shia versus Sunni, and you see something very scary. For Saudi Arabia, anyways, you see all their major oil parts are in Shia areas and they're right on the coast, right across from Iran, right? That's why we're in that region now with all our carrier groups. Now, do I care if that oil comes from Saudi Arabia, from a, from a dictatorship or from a democracy or a the, the, theocracy? Probably not. We buy oil from anybody anyways. But the point is, that's their concern, not necessarily our concern. So we're being pushed into a war that doesn't benefit us, it benefits other people. And thinking about The Adventurist, I I mean, it's obviously a book I've read. (laughs) And uh, see, there was an article in Recoil Magazine, which I'll link to in the show notes, which is great, about you and your story. And one of the things that you said, a quote in there was, uh, trying to change the world with my incredibly naive belief that people are inherently good. And uh, as the years have gone along and you've been doing the work that you've been doing, has that only become reinforced? Do you sometimes question that? Is, how, how's that coming? How's that working for you? <laughs> well, it works fine. Uh, the funny thing is, is that... As soon as you explain my philosophy to people, they go, oh, yeah, but wait, you know, wait until you meet these people or wait till you go here or do this or whatever. Um, I have spent my life trusting people and I've been burned a number of times, but I I take that as part of the experience. So I have traveled to, I don't know, 120, 130 countries around the world. Uh, I've been in maybe 36, 40 wars. I've been with some of the most violent people on the planet, and I have never really had any concern about my safety or welfare. Now, there are random wars where people don't really shake your hand before they kill you. You know, there's cruise missiles, there's drones, there's landmines, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there are dangers not related to sort of human intentions. But on the average, I found that people have been welcoming to me. And even when I was kidnapped in Colombia, you know, my, my captors got along with me and, and I wasn't mistreated, et cetera, et cetera. So I've never had that problem. Now, is that good advice for other people who are not intuitive? You know, if I say this to a 22 year old who is heading out to Mogadishu or, you know, someplace where there is sort of a, a terrorist element, I would say, hey, I was with the terrorists, so maybe, maybe my perspective is skewed, but I tend to be in the sort of the white hot center of the fighting as opposed to just sitting in a cafe. And as a matter of fact, one of the few times I was sitting in a cafe in Uganda, somebody put a bomb under my table. So I'm just saying that, yes, my philosophy works. The more you learn, the more you trust people, the more you listen to them, the better off you are. There's obviously exceptions to that rule, but people on whole around the world are actually good people i remember when i was in morocco i was in the military when i was younger i remember i was stationed in morocco for a little while and there was a town near where our base was and they always said don't go there don't go there they'll kill you right away and of course that just we were kids and that made us sneak out and go into town and (laughs) it got a little dangerous now and then but and I, i can't say that we're necessarily naive either we just walked in and I guess it's that spirit of adventure. So that's the idea of the adventurous. I really like that. And along with what you're saying about 
you know, having been welcomed by dangerous people, by terrorists, uh, there's a, a YouTube of yours. It's called Robert Pelton's The World's Most Dangerous Places Kidnapped, where you got uh, kidnapped in that episode. And, yeah. and on YouTube, the end is missing. No one knows what happened. You just got kidnapped and it ends. And so <laughs> if, you could, if, if you could tell us, that would be great. Um, I read it in the book, but it, it didn't make it into the YouTube video there. But one of your quotes was, I seem to have been welcomed I seem to have been welcomed by more rebel and terrorist groups than any other person I know. They seem to have a sense that I will tell the truth. It's just, so it really does seem to be the way you approach that is your an aspect of your safety net. Because one of the things of people who you know follow your work, well, it's, it's, it's that's night. Hold on, I got my yeah. My gardener has decided to turn his leaf blower on just outside the window. He'll be gone. <laughs> Isn't that classic? Oh, it's perfect. It's perfect. It just, like that. it just adds to the realness of the show, you know. It just adds to the ambience. Well, let me just say this: I, in order for me to get into Grozny in 1999, I had to meet with a number of people. And one of the groups I had to meet with was Bin Laden's group. And when I met with them, basically saying, "Look, I'm going here. You know, don't kill me." They. Um, they said, well, we know who you are. And I said, well, what, we read your book. And I said, oh, this is, yeah, it's about, about 80% of it is true. And I said, screw you. It's all true. And he said, no, no, that's not bad considering. And the point is, I've been so many different places and I've written about so many different groups and wars that these people do vet you. You know, they know what you write about. They know what you've said on TV or in social media or whatever. So I have a terrible sense of humor. I'm very dark and cynical. So if, if if I was meeting me, I would just shoot me dead instantly because I, I take the piss out of terrorists all the time. I remember drinking with um, Mono Hohoi, who was the military head of the FARC rebels in Colombia. And we were drinking vodka and Mirinda. And he was telling me all about what the FARC was doing for the Colombian people. And I said, you know, hey, stop pumping that Marxist sunshine up my ass. So I, <laughs> I do get into it with these people. But uh, my point is, Adhering to what you saw and what you believe to be the truth, because don't forget, you can see things and you can write down what you saw. That's not necessarily what happened. That's your perspective. Does resonate with people over a period of time. Yeah, and you mentioned, let's see. Uh, so how actually did you get out of being kidnapped in that oh, episode? Oh, sorry. So, yeah, so I, <laughs> yeah I, 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 still, I don't want to So let me tell that. you a story very quickly. So essentially, I was in Liberia with the Lurd Rebels, and I had filmed a lot of very gruesome uh, executions and beheadings, whatever. I got back. I was showing the footage to the Discovery people and uh, my wife, and she said, oh, that's disgusting, right? And I said, well, that's, that's what... That's what it is. That's what they do. And she said, well, you're kind of tweaked because you don't see that as being disgusting or grotesque. And I said, well, possibly, but I'm no, I don't think I'm tweaked. That's just war, right? When you cut somebody's head off or in this case, they were cutting people's hearts out and eating them. But it's to most people that can, that's considered extreme. But when you're in combat, that's kind of how war in Africa works. But anyway, so she said, you, you call up National Geographic and you tell them you want to do a camping and hiking story. So just to uh, shut her up, I guess, I called Nat Geo and I said, I, uh, my wife's mad at me. I have to do a camping and hiking story. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, when I was 19, I, I hitchhiked all the way from Vancouver down to Columbia, and I was supposed to hike the Darien Gap, that little 90-mile trail between the two continents, and I didn't. And I, I ended up on a tropical island breaking people out of prison, but I never did that thing. And it wasn't that I chickened out. I just I didn't see the benefit in, in hiking some sweaty trail to get from point A to point B when I could just fly there. So uh, I said, I'm going to go do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to Panama. I'm going to find some young people that are going to do this trail and uh, maybe burned out adventurer. We'll talk to young adventurers about why we do what we do, and we'll have this interesting conversation. And along the way, you know, the flora and fauna and whatever and the history. You know, the, the Darien Gap's very famous for people getting killed and kidnapped and whatever. And it hadn't been hiked for eight years. And the last people that hiked it got uh, vanished, basically, kidnapped and killed. So I went down to um, Panama and I met two uh, 22-year-olds 
who said they were going to hike the trail. Now, later on, I found out they had no intention of doing it, but that's fine. So they, they went with me. And um, I, I was very nervous doing this thing because I don't mind myself being in situations where there might be some tension or stress. I, I, I don't like looking after people who don't do that on a regular basis. Uh, so third day in, basically, we're hiking through the jungle. We just had lunch with some Indians and boom, 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 boom. And I said, that's AK-47 fire, and that's an ambush. I could tell by the patterns of the firing. And I said, okay, just stay here. Wait until the firing's finished. And these Indians came running back, and there were three when they left, and, and one was bleeding. The other one was – his eyes were wide as saucers. third one never showed up. He was killed. So I said, look, you know, I know the heads of the FARC rebels, and I know the heads of the AUC, Carlos Castaño at that time. Um, I'm going to walk into the ambush because if they think that we saw or were witnesses to a murder, they're going to hunt us down and we're going to disappear because nobody would even know what happened to us in the jungle there. And don't forget, we were three days in, in probably one of the more remote areas of that place. Um, so they went neat. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. They, they just shot somebody. They're probably all amped up. They're probably, you know, very nervous and twitchy. And I said, look, you know, keep about 100 yards behind me. Talk really loud in English. And when they start firing, whatever way I roll, you roll the opposite way. And then the other person will roll the opposite. Just keep rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and, see, and then just run. The other options were, of course, to just turn around and walk back. But I said, this column's coming towards us. Or just sort of head out in the bush. But I said, they'll track you because in the mud, it's easy to track people. And if you get caught at night or lost or something, it creates a whole other problem. So, so I decided to walk in the ambush. Um, I walked in there. They jumped up. They started screaming and yelling. Thankfully, they didn't shoot at us. And uh, they, they wanted to execute the guide, so I wouldn't let them do that. And then they got mad at me. And then we sat there for a few hours. But the point was that they went away, and they came back, and they pretended they were the FARC. And I knew Hold on one sec. AUC. Uh -huh. Oh, I hate sure. to interrupt you. Hold on one sec. I got I got to plug something in. Be right back. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Keep going. No problem. Um, when we went up to the ambush site. There was a lot of yelling and screaming, and um, they, like I said, they wanted to shoot our guide, and they kind of held us on our knees with their hands over our head and argued with them. I knew, I knew they were AUC Beck, uh, Lock Erna Cardenas, I think it's called, and one of the oldest groups, probably the most deadly group. And they went away, they came back with their T-shirts inside out, and they said they were the FARC. They made this big speech, and uh, I told the, the the crew, if you want to call it that, don't speak Spanish. Just sit there, smile, whatever. Just pretend like you don't understand what they're saying. And um, they gave us a huge speech about how they're there to help the Colombian people and that they're the socialists and blah, blah, blah. And I thought that's really weird that they had their T-shirts inside out and they were now were pretending to be FARC. And then I thought, well, were they FARC pretending to be AUC? And I'm like, no, the haircuts and everything, they're AUC. They had the very military type haircuts. Anyways, um, they held us, marched us at gunpoint for 10 days. And um, Mark Wittevin, who's dead now, but he, he was the young male, and he was born in Columbia, raised, adopted and raised in the Pacific Northwest, wanted to go back to and experience, you know, Columbia's homeland, had spent a year learning Spanish, going to visit medicine men in the jungle and whatever. I mean, it was a big deal for him, and he was kind of cranky with me that this was like a 10 day shot for me. And then I was going to hide a film crew waiting for me in Texas. And it was just sort of sandwiched in there. Um, and, you know, but he started talking to people and he began to talk to them like they were the FARC. And I kept saying to him, Mark, shut up, shut up, just smile. Um, to make a long story short, they held us in sort of a secret little paradise place with butterflies and boulders. And one of the 15 year old death squad gals got sweet on him. And I remember him in the middle of a waterfall on a rock with these little candles uh, with this 15-year-old girl. And then her boyfriend, who was all armed, of course, 
kind of snaps his fingers and ends that little romance. And I'm like, we're all going to die. I mean, we're all going to die, but not for the right reasons. Um, so what happens is that they march us. We end up in Arquia, which is in uh, Colombia. And during that time, Carlos Castaño was actually in negotiations with the Colombian military or with the Colombian government, uh, peace talks. And the AUCs represented the ranchers, right? They were the death squads that worked with the military and the ranchers against the FARC. Anyway, so they we 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 were told to sleep in the middle of a football field, and they had armed guards at each corner. And then about 4.30 in the morning, they came over and kicked us and told us to get going. We walked across a river into a graveyard, and I said, this is not good. And the guys that were guarding us were much older and wanted none of our crap, right? So they came to get Mark, uh, and I said, I'll go. No, I said, they took Mark away. And then they finally they came to get um, me, and, and we walked over to the river, and Mark was, was smoking. He didn't smoke, but he was, like, nervously smoking and laughing. And all the guys around him, these kind of fat pot belly guys with, and all these horses were laughing. So apparently what had happened was they had taken Mark. They had asked him, they'd asked him what he thought of the FARC. And he said, oh, they're, they're really great people. They're working to overthrow the sort of tyrannical blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you think of the AUC? Oh, they're cold-blooded murderers. And then the guy took his shirt off and underneath was this giant skull and crossbones that said AUC Beck and they all started laughing and he said okay we're not going to execute you you've been pardoned and so when I saw Mark he said we've been pardoned we've been pardoned he said I told you not to speak Spanish to these people so they put us on horses we rode out and then as we got to the top of the hill and we below us it was a beautiful day it was it was right out of a film I mean it was just gorgeous out there through the countryside they like, turned our horses to the left and the bar bar fence and we ended up at this finca this abandoned ranch and they had decided that they weren't going to release us and so i thought okay so i made my kidnap bowl i made a dam in like a swimming area and uh, i was just ready to be there for a long time and then they told us no no we want you to interview our leader and i'm like screw you you know i got a film crew waiting in dallas i i, I can't and I said, I'm going to spend my vacation here. You know, I'm working. So, no, no, wait, 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 wait. So uh, we were there, I think, for two days. And they had these pits, these narrow pits with barbed wire and all these IV tubes. And I thought, they must do some pretty horrible things there. Right? Um, finally, this guy shows up. And his name is Commander Alamon. And he wants me to interview him because he found out I'm from Discovery Channel. And obviously, I must be a big wheel. And I said, uh, I don't know if I can swear on your show, but I told him to go fuck himself. Oh, you totally can. And he said, no, 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 no. I said, well, you know, we're sorry. We just detained you for your security. I said, no, you marched us a gunpoint to the jungle and you killed not just the guy that went past us, but you went back to the village and you killed all, not all, but you killed three people that we stayed with. You decapitated them, disemboweled them, whatever. And so I wasn't very happy, right? And he had a guy, a big fat guy next to him that had a giant red cross shirt on and he said, oh, this is our director of human rights. And I broke out laughing. And I said, well, are you the guy that decides whether they use a chainsaw or a rock to kill people with? And he didn't think that was funny. Anyway, I was just done with the whole event, right? I just wanted a cold beer and a steak. So anyways, uh, you know, I did like a five-minute interview. And they gave us all our cameras back and all our gear. And then I went and had a cold beer. And the uh, U.S. Embassy wanted me to charge them with kidnapping. I said, no. You don't understand. This is a battlefield detention. You know, we walked into an ambush uh, voluntarily. And uh, if some AUC death squad guy wants to knock on my door a year from now, you're not going to be there. Right. So bottom line is that it was it was an adventure. It was an experience. But it, it was something where, again, I had not planned on going into a war zone. And I ended up in the middle of a conflict. And luckily, Carlos Castaño sent a press release to Reuters, which is still out there, saying that I was being held for my safety and I was being released unharmed, which 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 we were. So when you ask about people, Carlos Castaño has killed more people than I know, uh, but he specifically said that he was holding us for our safety. So that's not that's not a bad record with terrorists. Mm, quite an experience. Uh, so. The adventurist mindset, something I wonder about is, you know, managing fear. So, you know, to get into the adventurist mindset, uh, 
there's some quotes I wanted to look at real quick here, and it's from uh, Robert Young Pelton, Dangerous Places Revisited. It's a YouTube. And something that you said, there's some great quotes in there, and you said, we are losing the love of risk. We are letting fear prevent us from being great. And then you also mentioned, never confuse what you are afraid of with what can kill you. And then lastly, you said, if you, if you fear failure, you've already lost. And I think those would, ha I think if we looked at those lines, you know, quickly, uh, that that would help people get into the adventurous mindset. Because not everyone has to like risk their life to have adventure. Some people do. It, it's, a, it's different levels. You know, for some people, it'd be bungee jumping. For some people, it would be, you know, bravely going and getting a physical, <laughs> their yearly physical. You know, for some people, it would be taking on self-employment, letting the, the day job go away. So we all have, you know, what is adventure for each individual is, is unique, but I think the mindset to approach it maybe is not so, is uh, a common theme. So you mentioned we're losing the love of risk. We're letting fear prevent us from being great. So can you expound upon that? Because it is yeah, very true. Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, humans, by their nature, are risk takers. And, and not to give a science lecture, but the whole idea of hunter-gatherers or explorers is all based on survival. It's all based on having children and then having to move to a new place to set up a house in a field or whatever. Uh, it, it also translates into your job is – do I stay at this job or do I get another job that's more challenging or I might fail at? So the two things that you're seeing woven into society now is the removal of this important period in the, in the transition from a, a boy to a man or a girl to a woman. This used to be celebrated in societies where you were considered sort of innocent and um, you know in, in need of tutelage. And then you got to a certain point and the elders would say, OK, you know, go go hunt that lion, go out into the woods for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, most religions are based on this idea of going through this transition or hardship where you come out the other end more secure and clear in your future and who you are. So, uh, the idea of failure is, is kind of odd. Failure is part of everything. You know, it's it's like. I used to, I remember one day I was riding my bike through the Okanagan and I stopped at this lake and there was a 10, 20 and 30 meter board and nobody was jumping off the 30 meter board, but everybody was, all the kids were jumping off the 10 foot and then maybe once in a while somebody going to 20 foot. And I viewed the top board with awe, like, wow, I wonder what that's like to jump off of there. And then the next day I went there, all these kids were jumping off the 30 foot one and I said, why did I think that was so hard to do is it because I didn't even try. I didn't even ask anybody or attempt it. And, and this is my point is that you have to constantly challenge what your perceptions are. You know, what, what is dangerous? What is scary? What, and, and like anything, whether it's driving a car or riding a horse or flying a plane, of course it's scary at first because you have no idea what you're doing. And then you evolve with the skills and you become comfortable and then you become expert at it. So this, this apprenticing or life training is kind of vanishing because we're on computers, we're looking at things, we're watching YouTube videos, but we're not physically smelling, touching, you know, learning with, ta with tactile knowledge. So when you get into um, conflict and war, yeah, we have, we have Tai Chi, we have boxing, we have, we have physical things like soccer where we can compete, you know, per se, but there's no risk in those things, right? There's no risk. You can lose a match or whatever, but... What you find is when you go into an area of conflict or an area where people are being killed or dying is that your fears vanish because these people are facing much greater fears than you'll ever have. And I'll give you an example. My father was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease and, and everybody's going to die at some time. But it's very interesting when somebody tells you you're going to die and you have about six months to, or a year to live, your whole perspective on life changes. Because then you realize life is finite, not something that you can put off till tomorrow or figure out next week. So this sort of thinking changed my perspective where I would go to places where I didn't understand things, where I wanted to understand how things work. 
and be with people who had greater problems than I had, who had much greater fear than I would ever have, and absorb that. And then slowly, I remember sitting on a hilltop in, uh, just outside of Grozny, and they were firing tank shells over us to, to destroy this factory. And they're maybe 10, 20 feet above our heads. You could hear the actual tank whizzing, the shell whizzing. And the kids did it for fun because they were bored. And then a silver plane would show up, and that was a spotter plane. It was a propeller plane. And the kids said, okay, we've got about 10 minutes. So you look at your watch. Now, you couldn't see the jet that bombed you, but you'd see it flash as it hits the afterburners. So then you look up and you watch for the bombs. Now, they drop two 500-pound bombs every time. And the kids taught me, okay, if they're round, run, but if they're oval, just stay here. So I'm talking to 10- and 14-year-old kids about being bombed for fun. So I'm just <laughs> – when we talk about fear and, and uh, um, you know, maybe somebody hit dislike on my social media page versus learning how to get bombed by Russian jets, it's all relative, Right. And it's all within your capability to understand these things and worry about the real things in life, which is health, happiness, have friends. I mean, the things that guide you through problems are not necessarily having more likes on your Facebook post or, you know, the, the, the things that we're starting to use as badges of success and popularity. So adventure really is a learned skill by, by testing yourself, by doing something that uh, challenges your comfort zone. I like a no, bear mentors. Well, yeah, let's let's be crystal clear. So when you're a kid, you don't have a lot of responsibilities. Obviously, you can learn things and you can get a lot of responsibility very early. But you're supposed to have mentors. You're supposed to have people around you that say, "Hey, let's go learn how to do this," or "Let's go try that," in maybe a non-judgmental role. And then, secondly, you're supposed to be given chances to test yourself. And, and you know, the military is one example of that, where. You would then go from being a young teen into joining the military and you'd be amongst your peers and you'd be tested. How fast can you run? How well can you shoot? How long can you stay awake, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, from that comes self-confidence. And, but more importantly, the, the knowledge that constantly testing yourself is the evolutionary part of life, whether it's learning, whether it's physical fitness, whether it's intellectual discussion, philosophical discussion. And then you learn that there's a path in life that ultimately, if you were to pick a goal, it would be wisdom. The ability to look at somebody straight in the eye and say, look, the only benefit I've got of being on this planet for 60 years is I can figure stuff out in a meaningful way that might help somebody who doesn't have the, the experience. So are these things being taught? No. Are these things available for all young people? No. I mean, when we talk about the scouts, which is maybe the only last vestige we're more concerned about them being molested by scoutmasters, right? We're more concerned about political correctness and and not offending people. And, and I don't mean to sound like a Neanderthal. I'm just saying that look at cultures and how they treated their young to get them ready for adulthood. You know, the, the, the Indian tradition of going out into the wilderness and not eating and hallucinating and finding your spirit guide or whatever has a real value. I mean, it sounds silly, uh, when you talk about modern education, but learning all aspects, the spiritual, the physical, the mental, and, the, and also the, the emotional, makes you a calmer, wiser, smarter, happier person. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, if you look at the, in the Native Americans, I think, I forget if it's called the Buffalo Dance or the Sun Dance, but you look at that initiation into manhood and you think, holy shit, mm -hmm. you know, you got, <laughs> you got, you know, bone stuck through your, your nipples and you got swung in a teepee and you had to run with all the stuff hanging from you that was hooked to you with barbs until it all broke off and then they would cut off part of your little finger at the end. And you start thinking yeah. like, holy shit. I mean, but it did allow that child to die and the man to be born. That was the idea. So it, it kind of put life in a mythical context. You knew your part in things and you, if if you walked around and you had the end of your finger cut off, everybody know, knew, well, this guy's a badass because he, he made it through the challenge. Well, don't forget the, the scarification in Africa and all these sort of religious purification things are just an attempt to mark growth, right, in, in humans. And uh, just like if you get a PhD or a master's or whatever, it's supposed to imbue you with some level in, or status in society. And, and I'm just saying that we've created so many artificial levels like that. 
that when people say, hey, let's go to uh, Kabul on vacation and visit my ranch, they think I'm crazy. And I'm like, well, no, that's I like that. And that's good. And it's because you're going to meet great people. You're going to see great scenery. And they're like, oh, that's so far outside of my comfort zone. I don't even know where to start getting afraid. Of. Like, I don't know what I should be afraid of. I just know that sounds like a really bad idea. And I'm saying, well, OK, let me just get one thing straight. You don't have to go anywhere to find a war. War comes to you. Like 9-11, if there was any uh, any event that taught people that being here is safe, going there is dangerous, is 9-11, right? And, and now we see school shootings, and now we see a numerous ISIS-type bombings and whatever. And I keep saying to people that make a list of the things you're afraid of, and I'll show you a list of what you're going to die of. It's probably a very different list. So, so that pragmatism comes from facing threats and dangers and realizing what you should worry about and what you shouldn't worry about. Yeah, I think it was the great inventor Buckminster Fuller said that we worry about so many things, but what gets us totally blindsides us. So worrying about anything is just statistically not relevant, <laughs> as he put well, it. Well, it's like when you have a motorcycle accident, you have about, I don't know, 15 seconds of going, oh boy, did I screw up, and then calculating how bad you're going to be hurt, and then you do this little process like, I'm still alive, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. Oh, that hurt, that hurt. Okay, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. And it's, it's like this weird calculation of risk in real time. So all I'm saying is, is fear is, is good, fear is normal. Irrational fear is not good. But irrational fear is now normal. We fear terrorists, and we're more likely to get killed by a deer you know, jumping in front of our car than we are a terrorist bomb. So trying to get people focused on the right things is, is probably a goal of mine. But more importantly, finding other people who have much more to lose and much more uh, risk and helping them is really the thing that makes life very calm and relaxing for me. Mm. Yeah, it's really not the grizzly bear that's going to kill you. It's going to be a tick or a mosquito. That's been my experience, you know. <laughs> age, you're just sitting around doing nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's true. War does come to you, and we oftentimes have a lot of prepper, prepper-minded people in our society here in America who talk about shit hitting the fan. And But really, shit hits the fan in people's individual life. There's no big shit, shit that's going <laughs> to hit the fan. It you'll have a motorcycle accident, you'll fall down the stairs, you know, you'll get mugged. So shit hitting the fan is really an individual act more than I think a, a group well, act. It's, it's coming this. for everybody. Yeah, I, I will say this. The, the just-in-time thinking that built our economy and the reliance on electronics is really a recipe for disaster. Now, preppers, I like preppers because I might need their stuff. And when the apocalypse comes, I'm just going to go get their stuff because they're going to be locked in a little you know, bunker somewhere and with all my food buckets. But the point is, um, think about if the power went out for five days in the U.S., how paralyzed we would be as a nation trying to buy things, transport ourselves, feed ourselves, do anything. Because we rely on things coming in to grocery stores and fuel arriving and electronic cards and swipes. And I mean, we, we had a problem here for three days when the power went out. And um, you can't buy gas. The lights don't work. It can't work because there's no electricity. Everything's done on the computer, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you suddenly think, oh, my God, we, we are totally vulnerable to one thing being removed, which is electricity. Now, I'm, I'm not a prepper. I'm not a doomsday guy. I'm just saying something simple like that. And when you travel to war zones where there is no electricity and people get by just fine, you know what people do? They sit around and talk. They, they literally get more out of having no electricity because they sit around and talk about things. And and to me, that's that's a fascinating sort of archaic thing to do is just hang out with people and talk about stuff. Yeah, the original, the old school social media. <laughs> <laughs> You know. God, what a concept. We should invent that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Organic social media. And, yeah. and that one line was, never confuse what you are afraid of with what can kill you. So pretty much it's yeah. our fears are usually irrational. What can kill us is not something we expect. Yes. And which is normal for humans, by the way. We, we fear noisy things and large things. We fear mysterious things. Um, but, you know, the, the statistics of risk are also interesting because... We say things like, oh, it's much safer flying than it is taking a taxi, or it's easier to do this than that. When you measure the potential for death or injury 
by number of minutes exposed to that event. You get these really weird statistics that pop, pop up so that tourists are more likely to fall off a mountain than locals are. Tourists are more likely to drown than locals are. So you think things like swimming or climbing suddenly become lethal when you look at the number of statistics based on minutes exposed to it. So we go through our lives thinking we're going on vacation to have fun, and we read stories about this Dominican Republic hotel where everybody ends up dead because they drank some of the mini bar. That saturates the entire world. That literally travels around the world, sets up some fear in people's minds, and they will never, ever drink out of a mini bar or go to the Dominican Republic because they'll say, oh, you remember that story about the people that died in this hotel? So we, we, we tend to have these irrational fears because they're based on some real event or incident. And when we get hung up on fear, like you'd mentioned, uh, we are losing the love of risk. We are letting fear prevent us from being great. That definitely stifles our ability to adventure. It reminds me of, well, of course, the book, The Adventurist. And early in the book, you mentioned uh, somebody you met, uh, Kuskun was his name. And, Josh yeah. yeah, Kuskun, as I say that. And so he was somebody who you liked. You, you said, for the first time, I have found someone seeking adventure for its own sake, and he's tried to make a living at it. So really, we have to get fear out of the way and find a way to have that adventurous mindset so that we can have adventure for its own sake. I mean, it really is its own reward, and it's a journey a lot of people are not taking. Well, for example, there are people, when there's a fire, there are people that run out of that building, and there's people that run into it. So we, we have to admit that some people are wired a little differently. Secondly, risk seems a lot more exciting when, let's say, a photographer goes to the front lines and pays a guy to fire a cannon and whatever. You know, it, it can be manufactured as being risky. You mentioned bungee jumping. Bungee jumping is not risky. It's frightening. It's not risky. People don't normally jump off of high points and then they'll suddenly get snapped back. So we can do things to stimulate our adrenal glands and, and get the serotonin and all these chemicals going. But I'm talking about intellectual risk. I'm, I'm talking about going to a place or doing something where your mind is blown because you didn't know about these things, whether it's historical, cultural, or whatever. And, and I don't necessarily mean sports either. I'm just saying that your mind is, is basically endless. You can keep stuff and stuff in there, but your perspective is the important thing. So when you travel to as many countries as I have and you spend as, as much time in wars and trenches and rebel camps or whatever, you, you see things from different perspectives. So you're actually, the dangerous thing is you're challenging the narrative. You're challenging how people think about things. And we were talking initially about um, sort of information operations and, and people trying to manipulate your thinking. I see this being more and more a problem because people don't go out of their way to look at both sides of a conflict. You know, we cover war from one side and those other guys are, are, are heathens or terrorists, whatever. We don't actually look at the roots of these things and say, why are these people fighting us or why are they rising up against their government, et cetera, et cetera. We, we need to expand our intellectual terrain and we need to challenge some of our fears. And when I say fears, I mean, we fear terrorists, right? The word terrorist was invented to terrorize you, not them. And... We don't understand why these people hate us. We don't understand what this threat is that called ISIS or Al Qaeda or whatever. We don't understand school shooters. We don't understand rapists. We don't understand you know. So it's a big challenge to 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 get into that world and understand those people so that you are you can deal with it both intellectually and also physically. Yeah, and another one of your YouTube's uh, the, from the world's most dangerous places. Uh, you got a great line that kind of summarizes what you were just saying. You said, uh, when I travel to the world's most dangerous places, I see the best and the worst in people, and I see it with my own eyes. There's a purity in that, seeing life for yourself, unfiltered by other people's judgments. At a journey's end, I'm never really the same person I was at the beginning, but maybe that's the biggest discovery of all. Right, and I mean, that sounds self-serving, but <laughs> I'm just saying that... Oh, it's true, it's true. Instead of picking Ireland, go to Mogadishu and have your mind blown. I mean, literally look at a place that you're terrified of, understand the threats that are there, deal with them appropriately, and come back and go, wow. And, and I have to say, you know, I wrote The World's Most Dangerous Places. The first edition came out in the 
mid 90s and it gets updated hundreds if not thousands of people have said to me before i read your book i was going to do x but i read your book and i did y you know, I joined the Marine Corps. I became an ethnologist or whatever. And, and this, to me, is, is the portal. The first step is to not accept the standard trip or direction that you think you should take and, and do that sort of detour or that thing that you've always wanted to do. And it usually leads you down a completely separate path. There's something about uh, doing something. Like your, the books that you wrote, The World's Most Dangerous Places especially, uh, it helped to, by pursuing your interest, you created something, and that created momentum in life. And that book opened so many doors for you. You know, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned how you travel, and you'd come across you know, in dangerous places, and people had read your book. Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing that when we do something, uh, when we pursue our interest, it creates momentum in life that takes us where we just hadn't expected. Doors open, like Joseph Gamble said, that weren't there for anybody else, that weren't there before, but now there's this opportunity you have. Yeah, well, you know, you start doing something that's very difficult at first, and then you learn the ropes and it becomes easier and you develop sort of a, a network of people that help you get into places. And then your reputation starts propelling you into these places where people want you to go there. People welcome you to come there. I mean, I just got an invitation to be with General Haftar in Libya and, and things where people reach out to you because you're a credible source and they want you to be there and you, they know that you have a voice that can reach a lot of people. Um, the trick is not to get into that vortex too quickly. You know, there was a time, uh, I left, so 2003 before the Iraq war, I had an eight show renewal contract from discovery and no cut and also a celebrity endorsement fee. And I left that contract on my table because I was now transitioning from someone who was intellectually curious about conflict to sort of becoming a whistle-stop war tourist. In other words, I had to go to so many wars in a year. And I told you that story about being kidnapped and, and worried about the head of film crew in Dallas to start my next shoot. And, and I was now losing the focus and, and the serendipity of what I was trying to do. And I don't really plan anything I do. I mean, I, I see something that it fascinates me. I, I go there and I suddenly get sucked into sort of a whole bunch of adventures or trips or journeys. Um, if you see my thing on, that I did for Vice called Saving South Sudan, one of the things I really enjoy is showing people the mechanism. How do, how do you do it? Like, how did you get from here to there? And then the other thing I like doing is messing with people's minds. Like, I, I added a, a narrative, which was essentially taking a child soldier back to South Sudan, who had escaped South Sudan, become the manager of a Costco. And now I said, come on, let's go back to South Sudan and let's see if we can fix the country. Now, that is a, a ridiculous premise for a documentary, but it's a fascinating through line. And you can see how we descend from sort of shopping for a trip, you know, bribing pilots to drop us into a war zone and just end up in the middle of mayhem of just absolute brutality, you know. And I'm interviewing this poor Costco manager while guns are fired. I said, well, you think your wife would be angry? He said, oh, no, I'm with Robert. I'm fine. <laughs> so it was like... It's, it's almost surreal, but it's worth a watch. And you can see exactly what I do. No, that, that's a great documentary, and we'll definitely link to that. Um, I was having a hard time finding that on Vice. I, I, I'll, I'll find it, though. But I, I believe no, it's, the, it's on YouTube. You just it's, it's on YouTube? Okay. okay. Then yeah, and that journey of the uh, Costco manager goes back to the uh, back to Sudan. It, it's quite enlightening to watch because you watch this guy's sort of his, his, his mental decline along the way. He thought, I'm going to go save my country, but right. how exactly are you going to do that? And his frustration mm -hmm. with just not being actually able to do that. So, mm -hmm. so do you well, think... You know, I, was tired of, I was tired of rich white people telling us to save Africa. That's how the whole thing started. Is, if you remember, I wrote an entire edition of Vice something that's never been done since or before. And I explained the entire history of Africa and our involvement in Africa in this 50,000 word piece. And what I was trying to show people is that we don't necessarily help Africa by trying to save it, that Africans have their own problems completely unrelated to ours, and that sometimes we exacerbate it by pouring you know, millions and millions of dollars into a system that becomes corrupt, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't want to preach to anybody, so that's why... The, this this through line, this 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 gentle guy who's got PTSD and was horrifically abused by Riyak Mashar. I don't know. I don't. I don't tell people in the video, but 
Riyak Mashar had his father killed. The guy we go hunt down in the bush, who was who was the vice president, is now the vice president, but they tried to kill him. That man enslaved this guy and killed his father when he went to get his father, get the, um, get him out of the uh, army when he was in his young teens. So, I mean, there's a horrific undertone to that whole story that I just thought would just freak people out if we got into that. No, it's but it's real. Amazing. Every, every, every bit of it is real and every everything that happens is deliberately not to camera. And in other words, everything that happens is filmed live. There's no, you know, we go to find a truck and we find a guy that killed a guy to to get the truck. I mean, these, these aren't things we say, oh, let's say that again and do it. This, these are all shot in real time. Yeah, I definitely I have that magazine on the on the shelf. I, I actually got that from Vice and the documentary is great. We'll link to that in the show notes and it's definitely a must read. Yeah, and that's probably I think the best thing Vice ever did was that was that uh, that Well, Vice look, Vice does a lot of good things. They they at a time wanted to replicate sort of what Channel 1 did is get young journalists into places with conflict where young people were fighting it. And sometimes it was magnificent, and sometimes it was terrible. And uh, but they've done some extraordinary war coverage. And I mean, they're not getting much traction these days because I think they're kind of lost and going under. But it was a noble attempt. Uh, and don't forget, you know, the folks at Vice wanted me to work with them a long time ago when they first started TV, and I said no thanks. I mean, why would I do something for no money when I'm making lots of money doing my own thing? So. They also worship the world's most dangerous places. That was their Bible for their initial TV series. So it's, I think it's important to, to try to pull people into narratives, not just random video footage that you see from protests, which they're doing anyways, but build sort of thematic narratives that make it understandable for larger audiences. No, I get what you're saying. So if there was, I know, I know we've had you for an hour now, I'm not sure how much time you got, but I have another, just a few more questions if you got time. Sure. Uh, um, do you think that America is losing its romanticism of war? I mean, to me, most Americans have a certain romantic view of war. I just would just call it a romantic war, a, a romantic view of war. As you mentioned, we got our kind of personality when it comes to war during World War II. We were the great heroes. We saved everybody. Mm -hmm. And it seems that, not from a cynical perspective, that people are losing it, but I, I just think Americans are starting to lose that romantic uh, notion of war, and they're seeing it a lot more real. Uh, it, they're not quite falling for it. As in, there was a great um, YouTube you did. It was uh, Robert Young Pelton's The World's Most Dangerous Places, uh, Libya. Uh, dark heart and one of the things you mentioned is people don't like to look at misery and that's one of the things you were doing in that in that particular uh, show was showing them the misery of war showing them people you know eating hearts and such like that with the internet with greater exposure to diverse news and such it seems that Americans are I know I've kind of asked this probably a couple of different ways but basically are, are, are Americans losing their romanticism for war Okay, so you have to remember two very important things. When you, when you talk about war, there's different kinds of war. So the World War II type of conflict, which is a nation-on-nation -nation conflict, doesn't really exist anymore. Secondly, you talk about the conscript army versus the volunteer army. So right now, America doesn't fight their wars. They let other people do it for them. So they pay people to join the military, what they call the volunteer army, and they go off and do whatever they're told to do. And then sometimes they embed journalists and sometimes they don't. So we're not even seeing an accurate picture of what we're doing around the world. I, I spent some time doing missions with special forces and I, and I haven't spent a lot of time in combat with US forces. You know, I, I, I was in with the horse soldiers as they call them in 2001 and I've gone back and done missions, I've done training I've gone through you know, various programs and done training of those people. But what you find is as soon as you have a conscript war, people don't like war at all, at all. And people forget that World War II, they had protests. They had people that didn't want to go to war. They had conscious objectors. They, they said, why should we go to Europe to fix their screwed up system, right? Um, so we were never really thrilled with war. What we do, though, is we use war or at least our military power as a cudgel, 
And we say, you better do what we tell you to do or else we're America will come kick your ass, which is what we're doing in the Middle East right now. Once you trip that wire, once you start conflict in another country, you then start bringing in this huge risk adverse mechanism. And people may laugh at that when I say that our military is risk adverse, but I mean it's risk adverse. Where we don't blow ourselves up. We don't send thousands of child soldiers out there to cut people's heads off. We train people up. We put them in armored cars. We have medevacs. We have uh, you know, chow halls. We have armored can. I mean, we just, with this huge, huge financial burden suddenly descends on Americans. And we actually project very few troops into these regions to fight these wars. We do a lot of it by bombing. You know, we use a lot of drones and intelligence gathering and so on and so forth. But we literally can win any war we want. It's what we do after we win the war is the problem. So the romanticism of America at war came from doing the right thing, defeating bad people, restoring civility and, and commerce, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't seen that in a long time. As a matter of fact, World War II was probably the last time. I mean, okay, Grenada, you know, we, we, we whooped their asses in Grenada, but Panama – but we're not seeing any satisfaction in violence. We're, you know, we, 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 we suffer from Black Hawk Down syndrome, where we go in with the finest soldiers you can possibly have the best equipment, and these people are literally throwing rocks at us and firing AK-47s, and, and we're losing. We literally have to pull out because the political impact is so devastating that we can't win that war. And then you're seeing this in Afghanistan. Nobody wants to touch Afghanistan. There's, there's no win in Afghanistan. There's billions of dollars being spent and there's nothing to win. Even if we gave Afghanistan a trillion dollars, there's nothing to win because we're not invested in that culture. Now, here's the thing to think about. World War II was one of the last conflicts in which our soldiers married the local population in which you had people assimilating with the people that we conquered, or at least the, the people that we fought with, you don't see that anymore. You know, we're fighting culturally isolated wars in which soldiers in Afghanistan can't consort with locals and marry into tribes and form natural bonds. You know, so we're always fighting these very isolated sort of sterile wars. So we can't win those unless they're a punitive expedition. I mean, you remember Obama's last military act was to send B-2 bombers, sorry, yeah, B-2s that around the world to kill 124 ISIS members in the desert. It was an extraordinary expense, but it showed how powerful America is. We got no satisfaction from that. We, we, we killed a bunch of guys in pickup trucks that we don't even know in a country we don't even care about, and we spent millions of dollars doing it. So this is, this is the reality of war these days. It's, it's diffuse. It's confusing. It has no win. It has no sort of heart warming you know the last time i saw this when when we went into uh, afghanistan and i was with special forces and general dostum the people cheered us after we liberated them from the taliban it was like world war ii people lined the streets cheering and crying and throwing money because they've been liberated but within i don't know two months they they started shooting at us because we had not done what we're supposed to do when we liberate a country, which is just leave them alone and, and let them get on with their business. So, they're, they're, like I said, it's very difficult to say that war has an upside for the United States these days. Yeah, and as a soldier, it's also a lot easier to fight if you have a clearly defined mission. I think World War II is way more clearly defined. Um, like, I was in Somalia. Uh, and uh, when I was younger in the military, I was in Somalia for like four months. And one of the things that was very bad for morale there is none of us knew why we were there. We were just mm -hmm. there getting shot at. We're there, you know, fixing potholes. We, we just pretty much felt like, I mean, our, our mission individually became just don't get shot and get out of here. And but you got to remember something. We, we actually achieved the objective in Somalia. Most people don't know that. What was when it? we went into Somalia, it was, it was to open up the, the food distribution lines, which were being blocked at the harbor. So we used force. I mean, I mean, you know more than I do, but I'm saying we used force to do that. And then somebody on a different level said, hey, let's go get ID'd. And that was a completely separate activity within sort of the tier one community that became known as Black Hawk Down. But if you go back and look at the numbers, we did open the lines for the food distribution system. Remember that time there was a famine, which there is every year. 
and, and we did achieve our mission. It just never worked out that way in history. They never wrote that story. Oh, well, I'm glad I know what it was about now. I actually, <laughs> no, it's true. Now I, I know. I read about it in some other report. I, I did a great article about Black Hawk Down Reduction, which I made a clear point that America, when it has a singular objective in a short-term window, can do anything it wants. It's when it evolves into some kind of political morass or some goodwill thing that it just shifts into a big trough feeding pig pen for contractors and it turns into an industry. Mm, I get it. Well, n now I understand why down at the pier there was just big warehouses full of grain and they were, they yeah. were moving and we were uh, uh, guarding those convoys to go take the food somewhere. I'm not sure where it went, but it was going inland. It was leaving the pier and going somewhere else and we were making sure it didn't get taken. So, okay, so, so now I get it. You, you were providing free food, which destroyed the local economy. You were enriching the people who controlled access to the port and from the ports into these towns. And you were not necessarily solving Somalia's problem. You were just doing a short-term window, like these guys need food, let's get them food. And, and again, this is the same problem where Somalia is still a mess. It's, it's better, but it's still a mess. It still has the same problems of corruption, same problems with drought, same problems with infrastructure. America can't fix the whole world, you know, all at once. And so things like Iran, where they, and Venezuela, where they sort of look at these countries and they say, well, let's just make it worse and worse and worse and worse for those people, is actually where you breed terrorism, is where you breed desperate people, you know, who can be hired to do terrible things for small amounts of money. So sometimes we create our own problems. So if you made a world's most dangerous places too, I'm kind of curious if, if, if Discovery well, came am, back. I and, am doing the update. Okay, so, so you are doing it. So where are some of the uh, locations you're going to in the new world's most dangerous places? Well, so I'll give you a scoop. So here's the thing. You know, in the, in the conversation with my editor who loves the book, who owned it before she even started working at the HarperCollins, we decided that it is inappropriate now to do countries. Because, again, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you were fairly safe in the United States, and if you got on a plane and you went to Afghanistan, you had a whole raft of dangers, right, that you didn't face at home. And now we realize that there is really no boundaries to things like diseases, communicable diseases, whether it's bird flu, Ebola, or whatever. There is no barrier or fence that keeps Al-Qaeda or ISIS out of your hometown. There's nothing that says a shooting can't happen in your high school or in a public plaza or during a coup. So we're going to refocus on thematic things. And we'll have some, obviously, some discussion about countries. But even within countries themselves, you know, you can, as you know, you can go to Iraq or Afghanistan and go to the green zone, air quotes, and, and feel very safe and then feel very unsafe when you walk outside. But yet they only shell the green zone. They don't necessarily shell the outside part. So... We, we sort of live in a topsy-turvy world where we think there's safe zones and danger zones. So you can't really paint an entire country, like let's say Sri Lanka, which had a series of very violent terrorist attacks by ISIS, which nobody even knew lived was existed in the country, suddenly poisons the entire nation's tr uh, tourist industry. Again, is it fair to label that entire country like France, and say, oh, well, you know, this, this rock concert was disrupted by these gunmen and, and killers, so therefore don't go to France. So this is the reality we live in now. We, we have thematic threats, not so much geographic threats. It seems like dangerous places, yeah, are definitely evolving. How about... Is like well, let me give you an example. A, a, yeah. I can go to Damascus on a, on a tour. I can literally buy a ticket, plane fare, tour of Damascus, have a great time, stay in a nice hotel, literally 60 miles out of the town they're fighting you know al-qaeda so i mean this, this is the this is the reality of warfare these days i can go to mexico and i can go to a beautiful hillside resort or i can go down into the city where the cartel is cutting people's heads off and hanging them from bridges i there's, there's no sort of rhyme or reason to threat now there, there is no one safe place where nothing happened just the last last little thing okay. the most dangerous country on earth you know what it is no it's the Vatican, the Holy See. Statistically, there are more crimes than there are population in the Holy See. Now, there's also 18 million tourists that go there, and there's also a sort of organized crime, like pickpockets, thefts against these people. But statistically, the Holy See is the most dangerous country on Earth because it has the highest crime rate of any nation on Earth. So 
There you go. That's why you can't necessarily use statistics to determine threat. Mm. Well, in America here, we've got the the middle of the country with the uh, rains that we've had and the uh, mm-hmm. and, and and the uh, cold winter. You know, the summer's yeah. not coming quick enough, and they're having trouble planting. To some extent, a lot of crops are just lost. But also, I'm, I'm amazed at how much of the middle of the country is still underwater. I mean, there's some places you can't get here from there. You got to drive around the big puddle. Well, don't forget, so, we, had, we had fires out here. We had, I mean, all manners of natural disasters. They're not necessarily bigger. There's just more people living in these places, so we notice it more. And and I understand that we used to think that we lived on an island. That that North America essentially was a safe little, life, you know, free from all the woes of the world, and that other places were dangerous. Please tell me if I'm going to China versus Taiwan, which is more dangerous, or Afghanistan versus Pakistan, which is more dangerous. And and those numbers have sort of faded away to who are you, where you're going, what time of year it is, what your activities are going to be, specifically where you're staying. And, and then suddenly you get a little bit more accurate profile of, of danger and, and threats. Yeah, cities like Seattle and, uh, and San Francisco, I mean, they seem to me to an aspect of that is a dangerous place because of the homeless population as it grows and grows and grows it's becoming almost a city within a city you don't just have seattle you have seattle then you have a huge like secondary seattle that goes under the highway from the city to the uh, airport so you're, you're you're sort of describing a scene that would make you into a prepper now right with, with your food buckets and your <laughs> yeah i think society is devolving to a certain level and I think it's striating. I think you're seeing more haves and more have nots. I'm sorry, less less haves, but further distanced from the have nots. And you're seeing people turning to private security or, you know, ways to protect themselves but not necessarily their community. Um, I think people are a little bit more fearful these days. I think they feel like there's something going on that's not quite right, that they used to be better, you know, they used to feel safe. And and now we have security theater so that everybody feels like they're sort of a criminal, but they're not. And, you know, are, well, how did that guy get through and how did this murder happen and how did that theft happen? So, yeah, I think people are losing confidence in the state as a mechanism of security. I would say they, they are. So as we wrap things up, one thing I definitely wanted to touch on is – Refugee crisis. This is something that you're definitely, it seems, close to. Um, I've watched some YouTubes where you've talked about it. And, you know, in one of your YouTubes, uh, let's see, well, rather than quote anything, uh, uh, one sec, sorry, I got hung up here. Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, migration is the biggest single problem on Earth right now. And that was from a YouTube, I believe, where it was called Exploring Human Security. It was an inter- interview yeah. with you. And so you're definitely close to, uh, you, you've got a site. Well, you, so I spent you, two years rescuing people working with an organization called MOAS, Migrant Offshore Aid Station in Malta. And to me, there, there's a number of things that are affecting the earth. I mean, when, when we sit back and we say, okay, what what is really going on that we need to pay attention to? Um one of the things that people tend to miss is the globalization of movement, meaning that people who have a phone can talk to somebody, people in Mali can talk to their friends in Paris who needs a cook and he'll pay them X amount and hire this travel agent, AKA smuggler, and it costs this much to get smuggled into Europe. And when you get there, send money back and send your sister, your blah, 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 blah. So we don't see that. We don't see this movement. And and with the current administration, it's it's almost humorous when they build these fences and they they try to create. So, again, you know, security theater saying, well, this is going to stop migrants from coming to America. And it's like, no, it's not, because the price to be smuggled into all these countries just goes up with the amount of barriers they create. But it's still a thriving business all around the world. So when you see these migrant crises, uh, some people say, oh, that's global warming, that's caused by warfare. No, it's caused by people's natural, God-given right to move to find a better life. And, okay, 50 years ago, it's a hell of a journey from Central Africa to Europe. I mean, but you could probably do it on a steamship or whatever. 
nowadays they, they monetize these routes so that they're, it's actually more efficient to be smuggled into Europe than to fly. So people work as they go. They know which uh, bus to take. They know which job to get. You know, they pick fruit. They do this. And so a lot of the horrors you see are basically people that get to Libya and are exploited as laborers. You know, they call it slavery, but it's basically indentured servitude, which is the new form of slavery. Um, anybody who's ever worked in a minimum wage job knows what indentured servitude is. But the idea being that humans should and do move around the world, whether it's legal or illegal, whether they have to dig under, climb over, run around fences, whether they have to lie, cheat, steal, you know, whatever. There are massive amounts of what you would call illegals living all around the world. But they are all a sort of a self-correcting problem because if they don't get jobs, if they can't support themselves, they either get deported or they don't. So you're seeing with, with the, the increases in wages and costs, you're seeing this, this army basically moving around the world wherever economic opportunity and that's not a bad thing until you try to put up a fence trying to stop a river and say, oh, let's just stop this river right here and see what happens. And the exact same things happens with, with migrants. They just flow around it and overpower the mechanism. Yeah, in one of your YouTubes, uh, Heavy D and the Boys, there was a great quote that kind of fits the situation. You said, what you learn from doing this type of travel, from this type of goal, is that first of all the earth is round everyone is your neighbor we always think there's an imaginary line between countries there isn't and it seems like what would the answer be for the uh, I, as we call it the refugee crisis coming into America right now is is the easiest thing to do just to here make you a citizen here's your, here's your passport start paying taxes hmm. No, I mean, this, this problem is not new, of course, right? Not new. Mm -hmm. The idea is to provide work permits for people that provide gainful employment. And just like in the Philippines and Pakistan, you know, when they go to Abu Dhabi, they, they come there, they work, they live in housing, they build buildings, they do whatever they do in hotels, and they go back and forth. I, I don't support that system per se, because, again, it's, it's, it's a new form of slavery. But we are moving towards a world that wants to believe that nationalism or self-protectionism will fix things. And this is a byproduct of genetic extinction. We like to think that white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired people will make a nation work just fine in places like Hungary and Britain and whatever. And it doesn't work that way. You know, literally those countries are dying out. They're not breeding fast enough to replace themselves. And so migration is a healthy way. It's, 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 it's the way humans have, have worked all the time, is, is the way to build industry. Look at America. Imagine America without migrants. We, we would be sitting here looking at Indians roaming around shooting buffalo. You know, it's, so migration is, is part of who we are. Secondly, trying to say that we're going to stop this. Now, of course, there's legal migration and there's illegal migration. Uh, trying to say you're going to stop this just ignores reality, ignores the entire sort of black market, underground railroad, or whatever you want to call it, that feeds the system. And this happens all around the world. So I prefer to have a pragmatic approach to problem, whether it be starvation, migration, warfare, or whatever. These problems are found in people discussing them. They, they literally come from people sitting down saying, okay, we've got to solve this problem. Give me some new ideas, right? Let's not think this way. Let's think that way. What I see at the higher level is that people are promoting ridiculously old-fashioned ideas, like whether it's Steve Bannon or Donald Trump or these people that say, or even Eric Prince and his uh, East India Company solution for Afghanistan. These people are idiots. They're, they're trying to say that this thing worked in the 1800s. It should work just fine today, right? And I, and I say to them, Yes, a lot, of, a lot of species go extinct thinking that everything's fine until suddenly it isn't. We are a nation of everybody, right? We are a nation of thinkers, doers, travelers, adventurers, explorers. We need to use that power, that, the ability to reach around the entire world and talk to people, bring the brightest and the smartest and the hardest working here, and not be isolationist and say, oh, you're an American, you're not. Therefore, you, you live on this island. You can't come on the island. We don't like the way you look. We don't like the way you think. And so at some point, like 9-11, if you think that we've got it all figured out here and we don't have to worry about anything else, something very terrible usually happens to remind us that, no, we need to pay attention 
to other people and other ideas. And you're making a movie, you're directing a movie called The Crossing, related I'm to I'm working this? on a documentary about migration, and, and I have to be honest, it was a $6 million budget thing with NBC, Leonardo DiCaprio, Netflix. And when I presented it, they, they loved it, and they said, how are you going to film it? And I said, well, I've already been filming. He said, but how are you going to film it? And I said, no, you don't understand. I've, I've been filming it for two years. And then they got very nervous when they realized that, oh, you're actually doing this. You're actually filming these people traveling around the world. You're not, you're not influencing. You're not, you're not faking anything. You're literally traveling with people as they go through. And don't forget all my connections in Libya, Africa, Afghanistan. I mean, these are all legitimate people moving across the world. And then they kind of freaked out and they said, well, I don't think it can be done. I said, well, this, look at what I do. This is exactly what I do. So it's, it's just sitting so unfortunately, I, I wish that I was in the middle of directing this magnum opus, but I think everybody got cold feet, and um, it's still a great idea. And then, as what I am working on is my yeah. interview with Coney. Remember, remember Joseph Coney used to be a big thing. Finding Coney, yeah. So my my book that I'm working on now is called Finding Coney, and it's about the history of Africa through the lens of Coney and why we can't find this one middle-aged man who's sitting in Kafia Kingi, and the 800 million we spent, the millions of people that got involved with uh, Kony 2012, is why this one single human being defies the entire world. So that's, that's the book I'm working on now. And of course, I was set to go to Sudan and the country fell apart. So this, these are the realities of dealing with sort of what I do. And another question I got for you is there's the great book. Oh, one sec. I hit a wrong button. Oh, there we go. Uh, License to Kill. A great book. Yeah. If, if, if people would like to know, you know, lose their romanticism for what they think a military contractor is, it's, this is a great book. It, it does help a person understand, hey, what, what is life like in the, uh, as a contractor? But then from that book, this came out. The uh, Rohart, <laughs> my graphic the, novel, the, the graphic novel, and I'm just interested at how how that connection get made. How did a graphic novel come from License right, to Kill? So, so License to Kill is basically Eric Prince's first interview in which he's pitching me this mercenary army thing, and it's me going and living and being with all these mercenary and, and contractor companies. And one of the things I did when I met with Eric Prince was I said, well, what's your what's the most dangerous thing you do? And he says, well, it's this. 10 minute run we do from the green zone to the airport in Baghdad. And I said, okay, I, I want to hang out there. So he said, okay. So I went to Baghdad and uh, I, every morning I got up, put my armored gear on and uh, dodged all the rockets and the bullets and whatever car bombs went to the airport and came back, did the same thing. Sometimes I did it twice a day. And um, from that comes the story of these guys, these, these, these men who do this every day. And I thought it would be a great film. I think in itself, the story is fantastic because the lead character missed his plane and would have been in that carload of people that got murdered in Fallujah. You remember the Blackwater guys that got murdered? Yes. Okay, well, he was supposed to be in one of those cars, but he missed his plane. So Scott Helvinson went in his place. So the, the through line is this, is this Marine who doesn't talk to me for the very first part of the whole book, who then later comes to me and says, you're the guy. He said, you're the guy. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm the guy? He said, you're the guy. You're the guy. I read your book when I was a punk-ass kid, and I decided to join the Marines after reading your book. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> In other words, the, the linkage was profound for me, right? And he was tortured by survivor's guilt. And so he would take the lead vehicle, and he would be the guy that wanted to get shot at. Now, my team got blown up. I shouldn't say my team, but the team got blown up after I left. But the book is about that, that those discussions with those people. Because, again, remember, contractors are demonized. You know, security contractors, Blackwater are demonized. And this, this is no way, shape, or form an attempt to make Blackwater seem like a good thing. It, it's not. But it's, it's understanding the men that did this every day in their personal lives and some of the things they lost and some of the things that drove them. Um, was like almost like hanging out with Al Qaeda. In other words, trying to get inside a very secretive group that was involved in some war-related activity and make them human. So, the graphic novel. I, I met with a guy named Billy Tucci, 
who's a fantastic artist. Billy Tucci had done the revival of Sergeant Rock, and what he had done was brilliant. He, you remember Sergeant Rock was a big deal, maybe in the 40s or the 50s. Sergeant Rock, I'll look it up. Okay. But well, it shows you that you don't read comic books. But Sergeant Rock was this World War II guy, always getting shot at, you know, unshaven, lots of butter, butter, butter type above his machine gun. Billy Tucci found a group of Asian American soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge that were instrumental in, in winning all these medals and then took this fictional character, which is Sergeant Rock, and interwove this into this great comics uh, comic book. And the point is, is that he was so detailed in his drawings and he was so in love with these people that he continued to go to shows with these surviving Asian uh, Asian American uh, vets to promote their interests. And I thought that guy has a heart. That guy is going to draw a great graphic novel. And he did. So Roll Hard is, is it's like 10 bucks, something like that. But it's definitely one of my favorite <laughs> graphic novels ever. And it covers a subject that's really uncomfortable for people. And a lot of the people in the comic industry hated it, not just because it was about Blackwater, right? But if you actually read it, most people say, wow. I mean, that's that's a very moving story about a group of guys that risk their lives every day just to feed their families and the interwoven conflicts and relationship between them. So anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a great little graphic novel. Oh, it definitely is. And this, is my like... jo- this is my job is to take you places that you would never, ever go, introduce you to people that you would never, ever meet, and at least allow some understanding of what they do and who they are, right? Just knock down that fear, knock down that sort of prejudice or to anger and let you understand just a little bit of how the world works. In License to Kill, I think one of my favorite sections was where you you you're in the barracks, that's what I'll call them, where everybody where the contractors were living and somebody had pets, somebody had I believe it was birds and that actually made it to the uh, graphic novel. Well, that's the, the gentleman there. That's the, that's, yep. that's the, the Troy, that's the guy that changed his life because he read my book and those birds were, were a method of functioning, of dealing with this horrible PTSD from, from surviving this event. I mean, you know, he should have been dead. And, and, uh, and through this comic book, and I guess that's really the point I'm trying to make, is this is what drove me to make this comic book real. I shouldn't call it a graphic novel. is because there, there's a story of hope. There's a really interesting story about a human being who's tortured and, and hurt, who actually feels much much better about what happened because he was able to talk about it because i was able to write about it and and do this graphic novel and we're still friends to this day does he still have birds (laughs) no no no. he just (laughs) he he was raising these birds just like the bird man of alcatraz it was just sort of a weird outgrowth of his anti-socialism and then another book that i think it's the last the latest one you've written is the raven and it's Sort of based on a school, the St. Augustine, that did or, no, or Saint, does Saint exist? St. John's Cathedral. St. John's Cathedral. And Boy so school, yeah. this book is sort of, you actually went there as a child, right? Yeah. That, yeah. So Raven is my first and only fictional book. I'm, I'm not a novelist by any means, but I wanted to write a book for my grandchildren to read when they were 10 or 11 or 12 that takes you through this journey, what we talked about originally, this sort of coming of age and the things that shape you. And I was sent at age 10, I was I was the youngest kid at that time. And um, I was told that it was one of these uh, adventure boy schools where you learn all, you know, Latin, ancient Greek, blah, blah, blah. You race farm animals, you slaughter them, you sell them, you process them, you sell them door to door, you raise bees, you sell honey. Uh, you snowshoe all winter. You canoe a thousand miles every summer, and this school is famous for two things. It's it's now shut down, but the fam- the two things it's famous for is killing twelve students and one teacher on a canoe trip because of hypothermia, and the other one is bringing back one of the students back from the dead on a snowshoe trip. So it's, it's not much of a roster, but the the book. Is, is a fictional weaving together of my experience there and, and, a, and a kid who gets lost in the woods after his canoe group dies. 
and that this school is eager to show how tough they are and how adventurous they are. And it ends up in the death of the students. And then this child who's 10 at the time is essentially lost in an area called the Stikine River uh, Gorge, which is a fantastically beautiful place. And he learns it's all written in real time. So as he gets hungry and as he gets cold, et cetera, et cetera, um, he starts to learn the basics of survival by observation, trial and error. He then starts to communicate with the animals. Now, if you've ever not eaten for two or three days or not slept for two or three days, you start to hallucinate and you start to see things and hear things that are not necessarily readily apparent to normal, well-fed people. And so he begins to see things happening that he doesn't know if they're real or not, but they're essentially guiding him towards staying alive. And the raven is a trickster. You know, the raven's both a good and a bad influence. And the raven accompanies him through this journey as he goes downriver and, and ends up, I won't spoil the whole story, but he's essentially being assimilated into a tribe that wants to get back to its roots, but can't because it's impossible but he then is, is scarified and goes through a procedure in which he becomes a man and he chooses to be the raven and et cetera, et cetera. And it's an, it's an attempt to make kids think about things that are possible, things that could happen. Everything in the book is, is real except the events, you know. But the, the thing that I thought was fascinating is uh, I was contacted by a major publisher who said, can you write a kid's book? And I remember I wrote the Indiana Jones survival guide and all that kind of stuff. And – I said, well, I'm not really into writing kids' books, and I'm not really into writing fiction. He said, no, no, let me, sell you some, let me send you some of the sales figures of some of these books. And I started looking up things like Hatchet and other, the Other Side of the Mountain and uh, Lord of the Flies, and I'm like, oh, my God, these things sell in the millions. As a matter of fact, one of the best-selling books in the world is the Boy Scout Manual, right? And I said, well, that's interesting. So I took a crack at it. And the first editor, editors have a bad habit of getting pregnant and then quitting and moving on. The first editor was absolutely enraptured with the idea of me writing something for kids, right? The second one read it and said, this is unpublishable. And I said, well, first of all, it's 800 pages long. And I said, you know, Harry Potter, all these major books are all quite long. And, but they wanted something that was fluffy and light and kitty. And I, said, I wasn't, wasn't going to write down to kids. You know, I was going to write as an adult for someone in the 10 to 12 range. And um, they wanted me to do a bunch of things to it. And I said, I don't think so. I'll just publish it myself, just like I did The World's Most Dangerous Places when nobody would publish it. Is that I will just back my own words with my own money and I'll publish my own book. And so that's what Raven is. It's basically a, a book I wrote for myself, for, my next, for the next generation. And you actually, uh, that school, you mentioned in a, a post, it was on Facebook, you, you said, uh, I bought the freighter canoe I paddled a thousand miles in when I was 10 years old. I cut it in three pieces and burned two of them so it could not torture any more children. The remaining yeah. piece holds some of my many bizarre mementos. And so you really did that. You, you actually have one of those canoes. Yeah, you yeah. went and It's a huge freighter canoe. And you made it a now, trophy. One of the reasons those kids drowned is that they modified these canoes to hold more uh, people and more uh, freight. And that made them tipsy. So that's why when they when they got caught in, in wind, it started tipping over. And as people came to rescue them, it more tipped over and they all tipped over. And they had a thing then when they said, oh, stay with the boat, which is something you're supposed to tell kids when you're in the summertime and you're water skiing. But when you tell kids to stay with the boat and it's water's almost freezing, that kills them. So the only kids that survived were the ones that said, screw you, and, and swam to shore. That boat was part, I, you know, I carried a canoe nine miles. We, we did the Grand Portage, which is probably the largest portage in the world. Definitely not designed to be done by kids. That canoe, I canoed every day for, I don't know, a month. Just constant, repetitive ba -dum -ba -dum. When I found out it was for sale, I bought it. I cut it, like you said, in three pieces. I burned, ceremonially burned the parts I didn't want. And I had my uncle restore it, who's a master woodworker. And to me, it's like a little talisman. It's like an icon. So everybody should have that chance once in a while. <laughs> to, to you, you made it a trophy. Universe. That is so great. Yeah. If you ever have that, you know, the Raven open for editing, you know, and you, if you made that like an appendix, the last page, a picture of that, <laughs> I, should. I mean, that would just, that would complete the book. It's so amazing. And so I've had you here for just about almost two hours. I'll, I'll let you go. 
But right. I wanted to ask you one more thing because you're wearing the T-shirt, DPX gear. So oh, yeah, yeah. you are now doing um, uh, uh, D DPX gears. You're making amazing knives. I have one, two, myself mm -hmm. actually, DPX gear. It's badass <laughs> stuff. And some of your knives even have the Raven pattern on them. Yeah, which that's, I think that's is a new one that just it, came out. Is amazing. Well, so so tell us about that. I, well, so I got an egg by a guy named Jeff Randall, who is a survival instructor. For, I think eight years or ten years, saying you need to do a knife, you need to do a knife. You need, and I said no thanks. And then finally, 2009, 2008, I said, yeah, why not? So I designed this knife, very small, robust knife. It did very, very well. And then, of course, my business hat came on, and I started looking at the knife industry. And I said, well, you know, we need to make folders because that's a, a lot more lucrative thing. Uh, Jeff wasn't able to do that, so I essentially started my own company to do that. But one of the things that drove me was that the special forces people in the, the military that I met were issued these crappy little knives, like lowest bidder type thing, you know. And so I started making these knives and designing these knives to basically give away to the, the teams, right? And... I, I'm not like a flaming – I have 24 patents, but I'm just saying the goal was to make a very robust knife based on what people actually used in the field. And so it does well. I mean it's it's it's, it's not General Motors by any means, but the idea is here. I'll show you one here. It's a, I just did one made out of hammered copper, right? But the thing is you can't hammer copper, so you have to design a CNC pattern that mimics hammered cotton co – copper and this is part of our you know made in the usa line where we zach brown the musician uh, has a knife building company that we're his only customer but he builds our knives for us and so it's, it's a little bit of american ingenuity bringing jobs and money back to the states and then also designing things for american troops and it's just a little bit of giving back but you know do I get involved? People ask me about knife fights all the time. And I said, no, you just call it an airstrike. You don't need to get into a knife fight. I'm not a knife fighting person. I'm not, I, I try not to get into fights. So I'm, I'm selling a, a tool basically for self-defense and, and utility. Yeah. I'm not really sure if anyone wins a knife fight. Everybody gets cut in a knife fight. Maybe, <laughs> exactly. it, it, maybe you lived a few more minutes than the person who died first, but I'm not sure. Right. You it, seem to be just, quite experienced in that. that it, area. Yeah. It, it lacks intelligence, but yeah, yeah, I've got, I've had one forever. I'm not yeah. sure which run this was, but that's, I've got that's, one. That's the Hess. That's, that's the first knife with the yeah. walking. Bar, yeah. yeah. Love it. Well, they're very, very well built knives. They're very strong. And, um, well, one thing I hope that I see out of uh, DPX has, I mean, I mean DPX gear. Everybody go to DPX gear. Check out Rob Young Pelton's yeah. knives. But what's well, something I'd love to see since I got you, you know, in an interview. I hope one day. And this is something I would just have to buy, even if I was broke, no matter what it cost. If you made it, I'll buy it. So if you just want to make one and charge a remarkable amount for it, I'll make it profitable for you. If you made a traditional Bowie knife with the Raven pattern on it. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, now you're mixing two cultures here. You're mixing yes. the Quackyoodle culture from the West with the Texas. And that's how we all survive. That's, <laughs> that's, that's progress. All right. Well, I'll, it's I'll been, file that away. I'm working on a, a chop that's got the Borneo tattoo patterns on it, which is mind-blowing. Uh, we've got a few other things. We, we're working on a Billy Waugh folder. Remember Billy Waugh, the world's oldest CIA paramilitary and friend of mine? We finally got his four-inch folder into production. So it takes forever. I mean, the, building things is much different than writing things. You know, there's a lot more pieces. But uh, I, I try to be a, you know, I try to have a finger in every little pie if I can. Mm, that sounds great. Well, we've had you for an hour and 52, so almost two hours. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, where can people get a hold of you? Is there anything that I missed? that we missed to talk about uh, well usually i'm somewhere that I, i'm not trying to get a hold of but um i think uh, i'm on twitter i got kicked off of facebook for pointing out that facebook sells its data so that tier one operators can use it to hunt down and kill people they didn't like that so they nuked me off of facebook but i'm on twitter and i have comments on various unfolding events that maybe are enlightening um you can direct message me on twitter which Hopefully I'll get that. And then uh, Come Back Alive is my website, and DPS Gear are the knives. 
And um, I'm usually out there doing interviews. You know, I did a bunch of stuff with John Walker Lynn, you know, when he got out of jail. So I'm typically out there running my mouth about something related to what I know or was involved in. So just Google my name whenever you get bored and you'll be entertained for hours. Yeah, and you definitely have a, an active Twitter Twitter feed. So if, if people want to get a hold of you, want to see what you're doing, what you're thinking, that's a good place to look. And yep. there is, how about uh, in Come Back Alive, there is a Black Flag Cafe. Yeah, Black, okay, so Black Flag. <laughs> is, is, is that still alive? It has slowed down over the years. No, what back. happened, Black Flag Cafe, when I was on TV and, you know, the, the book was running, it was a fantastic place where people got together. So you had about 80% meat and about 20% fat, right? And maybe 1% gristle. And we would have like uh, Coliseum night where we would just kill certain people by saying, okay, who should we kill today? Okay, this guy's an idiot. Poof, off he goes, right? Like trolls or whatever. Um, and then it's sort of I sort of give it to the people as a place to share information. In other words, it's not me answering all your questions. It's various people who know things saying, well, I was here and I did this, try this, whatever. And then uh, it was sort of infiltrated by people who would then reach people on the outside and tell them one thing and then do another thing. And I mean, it's very interesting how it sort of devolved into sort of this uh, fist fight, the you know, Western bar fist fight milieu. And uh, I think a couple months ago, I just killed off all the trolls. And, and my goal is, is to, to get it back up and running again, because with the new book coming out and with people interested in ideas and with the, the ability of social media to both censor you, block you, you know, sort of marginalize what you're saying. My goal is just to get people together to talk about stuff. You know, I, I don't monitor. I don't. I mean, if you're if you're threatening to kill somebody, obviously, I'll throw you off. But the goal is to say, hey, I'm going here. Does anybody know something about X? And then help them find, reach out and find people who are either working there or been there and facilitate that. Now, Lonely Planet had a huge, you know, chat or forum and they nuked it all. They literally nuked it all because they were terrified of liability. So, and there was one, there was another one that was a copy of mine, which is now gone. But it's, it may be the last sort of place where you can reach out to people and ask them questions about travel. And they get flamed and then <laughs> abused by people who've never been there. But you'll find people who will reach out to you and, and give you advice. So. Yeah, and I think it's very timely with your new book coming out to yeah reinvigorate the Black Flag Cafe because yeah. I think that's where social media is going. Social media is always an evolving thing. It changes. And I think we're going from the big centralized Facebooks and YouTubes to basically we're getting old school again. We're going back to the mid-90s where the message board the forum is going to be i think what we see more people are going to go from you know you, you raise a really good point and sorry to, to hog no, no, some time here yeah. but what people are learning about facebook is it's an artificial echo chamber you're surrounded by nothing right and, and you think you're talking to people but you're not talking to anybody except yourself and then they're selling your data not while you're on there but when you go off the site they're also selling you data and they're selling your friends data so you're now being profiled, which, you know, who cares, right? Who cares if I like pizza here and my name is this and I've got X number of kids. Or whatever. But it's when those things turn into home mechanisms like you're seeing in China when people do searches for terrorists. Uh, one of my special forces friends had all his property seized, all his bank accounts because they typed in the wrong social security number. They got this, this felon had the, the same name, but they typed in his my friend's social security number, and they immediately just wiped out everything he owned, and they were able to use social media and big data, as they call it, to find all that stuff. So uh, something like the Black Flag Cafe, there's no commercial intent. There's no me selling people stuff. Um, it's just people talking to people, and if you, can, if you want to have an alias, that's great. If you behave yourself, that's great. And if I feel like killing you one day, then I'll just delete you. But only because you did something that was socially awkward or deliberately harmful or threatening or whatever. But this is the my point is that we used to manage social media. You know, I used to moderate your comments and you moderated mine, but now we've got some weird algorithm literally looking for certain words or pictures. Like I can't tell you how many times I was in Facebook jail for, for, for no reason at all, just because somebody didn't like some thing that I did or said. And, and this is what's sad because uh, one of my friends is, is a Facebook censor and they don't do anything until somebody complains about it or an algorithm finds a picture or phrase or statement or link and then they automatically nuke you. 
And so this is what's messed up about social media. It's, it's becoming antisocial. It's becoming sort of big brother watching you, monitoring the way you think and talk, and then immediately deleting you from the system. And you know how many financial and social things are linked to Facebook now? You know, link, you know like log in with your Facebook account or do this. So it, it's, it's a growing danger in that we're giving away our data points, and then they're being used against us to control us or limit our involvement in things. Anyway, that's the end of my lecture on that. Oh, no, I think it's great because I, I, I do see the Black Flag Cafe, that style of social media, of discussion. That's what's mm-hmm. next. So it, I think it'll yeah. reinvigorate itself because one thing about Facebook is, and the centralized social media that freaks me out, is if you study uh, the Stasi mm-hmm. and you look at what they were doing in detail, that they were keeping on card files, you know, mm-hmm. where did you go? Who are your friends? Who are the friends of their right. friends? Where were they? You look at it and you go, holy shit, like this, the Stasi put so much effort into doing well, this. Well, imagine and- who my friends are. Imagine yes. if you did a network rude. and you linked every terrorist <laughs> group in the world and you go, oh, we need to drop a bomb on that guy right now. We don't know what he's doing, but he sure knows a lot of people. Yeah. So it yeah. also inhibits journalism and, and research. And you see this with Julian Assange, who admittedly was working with the Russians, but only publishing things that were actual government documents. So you're, you're seeing this whole thing shifting towards controlling publication of information and, and thoughts and opinions, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so beware and travel to places that don't have social media or any even internet and you'll enjoy yourself immensely. That's, that's all I can say. Like Sudan, they just turned off the internet and everybody probably had about eight more hours a day to do stuff. Oh, that's amazing. They'll have to yeah. wait to uh, post your selfies to Instagram till the internet comes back on. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so right. much for being on the show. This has been amazing. Uh, we'll have this pleasure. up probably this weekend or Monday. I'll send you a link when, when this is up. And sure. thanks a lot. It's been great. Okay. Thank you, sir. Talk thank to you, you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Radiant Creators. Check out more content at RadiantCreators.com. If you like the show, give it a like. Share this. Comment. Keep the conversation going. You can also find us at AlternateCurrentRadio.com, where there's this show and a lot more.